The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello, it's The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, Paris's resurgence. Is the French capital stealing London's thunder? Plus, Marlene Dumas at the Musée d'Orsay and Christian Boltanski remembered. As established and up-and-coming galleries open branches in Paris and the FIAC Art Fair opens there, I asked Melanie Gerlis if this is indeed a shift of power from London to the French capital. For this episode's Work of the Week, Donation Grau, curator of contemporary programmes at the Musée d'Orsay, discusses a painting from the two shows of the work of Marlène Dumas that have just opened at the museum. And as displays paying tribute to Christian Boltanski, who died in July, open at the Château de Versailles and the Louvre and the Centre Pompidou in Paris, and Lisa Rimaldo, curator at the Pompidou, remembers this leading figure in French art of the last 50 years. Before all that, why not subscribe to the art newspaper? You can currently make a big saving on the quarterly price of our complete subscription. That's the printed newspaper delivered to your door and full access to the digital content on the website and on our apps for iOS and Android. Subscribe today to get the offer of £22 or $29.25 per quarter. Go to theartnewspaper.com and click on the subscribe link at the top left of the page for this and our full range of subscriptions. Now, this week, the FIAC Art Fair opened in Paris, as did a branch of the Scarstet Gallery and a new addition to the Gagosian Galleries in the French capital. For some time, there's been talk in the art market of a resurgence in the French capital at the expense of London, which has been hit by the various complications of Brexit. But how accurate is this characterisation? I spoke to Melanie Gerlis, an art market columnist for the Financial Times and an editor at large for the art newspaper, to find out. Melanie, before Covid, there was a sort of setup going on which was suggesting that France was going to take over from Britain as the sort of European centre for the art market. How much credibility did you think that argument had? I think that was entirely credible, actually. I think a lot of it was, I mean, there was fear about what Brexit meant logistically and for tax reasons and so on and so forth. I don't think that's become any clearer. But what happened was galleries that were perhaps maybe thinking of another location in Europe or the, even their first location in Europe thought, well, Paris is looking good. And it's also had its own resurgence. Uh, its museums are looking very strong. It's got some new private museums. And it seemed a good place for galleries to go. What then happened, as you say, was was COVID. So yes, a lot of momentum disappeared. But then what's happened since COVID is a lot of galleries are opening everywhere. So it's not just Paris. Um, we've had pop-ups in, in you know, Aspen and so on and so forth. And Paris has benefited kind of twice because the momentum had already started. And I did get a feeling that, that it was still, it, it's still feeling pretty strong there. Right. So, and, so what's happened in terms of the gallery setup? So Skarsta has now just opened a new branch. Yep. Gagosian is expanded, has opened another branch. Yep. And we've also had, there's been other branches open from Almin Rec and things yep. like that. And you've also had, of course, Sverna open there before the COVID crisis. So what we do have is sort of, you know, clearly major galleries are opening up in Paris. Absolutely. And you've got this complete uh, revival of this Avenue Matignon area um, where, well, not Gugazian, actually Gugazian's opened somewhere slightly different, but the Avenue Matignon where Christie's is also completely revamped its building and it's become a kind of right bank magnet for all these galleries. And if it was just a Brexit issue, then in a way all these galleries need to do is have an office and an address for, for tax purposes. And these are not offices and addresses, they're rather gorgeous, beautiful, meaningful galleries with proper shows. But are we seeing a corresponding decline in terms of London galleries? I guess the highest profile disappearance from the London scene was the Marion Goodman Mm. Gallery, even though they do actually have an office in London still in a sort of space. But fundamentally, are we seeing any more of a shift from London to Paris? Not as dramatically as you know as, as I would like it <laughs> as a journalist <laughs> as I would like it to be um, but there is a definite I think London is going through a slight sense of insecurity at the same time as Paris is feeling quite secure and confident but London is always going 
to have the market. Uh, it, I mean, we saw at the auctions last week, London was a kind of trading centre. And if you deal, that's what you want. And Paris has a very, very different, I mean, it feels very, quite deeply institutional. I mean, the gallery shows there this during around FIAC were almost they were almost kind of you, you go everyone was in Paris to go to the museums oh I've seen Basilitz at the Pompidou and Morozov at Louis Vuitton you must see you must see and then they get to the fair and some of those artists so I mean there was a, a Basilitz in every booth possible um, <laughs> but it just felt longer term deeper sort of deeply cultural whereas in London people are partly here for the auctions and you can't sort of big trade in young artists' names, as, as I know you've been talking about. And you saw that as well at Freeze. It's, it's that same kind of atmosphere. And galleries need, need the trade of London still. One thing that we are noticing is that African art is doing very well on the market, contemporary art. Is that something that you're seeing sort of reflected in Paris? Absolutely. I mean, there's that, that's one thing that's really worth mentioning, which is it's not just the mega international brands who are opening uh, in Paris. You've got, because of that, there are often language links uh, between African countries and Paris. And um, so you've got people like Cecile Fakouri, who is in, you know, in the Ivory Coast and Senegal, has also opened in the Avenue Matignon this week. Uh, Marianne Ibrahim, opened a few months ago and she's very 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 serious about showing African art in Paris so I think it, it's not just the megas there, there are also some some small African art galleries who are really using Paris as a base and of course there's this rather nice opportunity to compare the two scenes over the last two weeks aren't there because of course <laughs> it was Freeze Art Fair last week as we as we speak and 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 right now it's FIAC mm. so tell me about your experience of the two fairs well, I was really struck by how different the crowds were um, at each fair. I mean, I had this when well, we've all had this like, oh, my goodness, another fair, back to back fairs. It's been a long six weeks. Um, and I couldn't quite believe that I sort of I felt like I'd walked out of the freeze tent onto the Eurostar. But I recognized very, very, very few people from freeze. Um, and it, I, I found that very interesting because you can sort of see why. A gallery would do both, and much, I mean, uh, much more French is is the best way I can put it, but that's a pretty good catchment area. Um, a much more serious crowd, um, fairly, and you, it's reflected in the galleries as well. I mean, FIAC has, I think, nearly a third of the galleries are French, but this isn't a kind of concession to, to local, no one is compromising, because you suddenly realise how good the actual, it's not just the overseas galleries, who have opened in France, the French galleries themselves. You know, you have Canon Menor, you have Jocelyn Wolf, you have, you know, galleries who are French-ish, um, such as Max Hetzler, who has a big space there. They put on unbelievably good booths as well. Whereas in London, you've got the younger, it's probably more fashionable, well, trendy fashion rather than that sort of chic French fashion. Um, <laughs> but it just felt more pacey and young and lively in London. Uh, and a bit more serious at FIAC. That's really interesting. You mentioned Camille Manour mm. there. And it, of course, this is one of the things that we're watching in terms of the market, in terms of how galleries behave in terms of fairs. Because, you know, is it going to be, OK, fairs are reopening. We, you know, we've had all these postponements. The fair scene is back. Are, are galleries going to do as much as they did? But for instance, Camille Manour decided not to show at Freeze and does show at FIAC. Is this something you think is going to happen more often? Galleries are going to pick and choose more? Oh, definitely. And I and there were a couple of other, uh, Jocelyn Wolf the same. And don't forget, some of these galleries had also shown in the beginning of September at the Independent or, or Armoury. There is a definite sense that, yes, we've had back-to-back -back fairs, we're all giving it our all, we need to squeeze four months into, into one, but this is not how we're going to carry on. Um, we are definitely going to pick and choose more. Uh, in a way, that's boosting the gallery growth that I was talking about before. I mean, I had a brilliant conversation with Ivan Worth at Hauser and Worth, who said, oh, no, he said, we are, we are halving our fares. You know, he used the word precise. We need to be more precise, more strategic. But then when he, he said he was halving, I mean, that's down from about 21 to about 10. So that was quite a lot to be doing in the first place. But I think that is the pattern. Everyone is trying to just think a little bit more strategically about what they need. Do you think that's an economic 
consideration. We talked last week on the podcast mm. about the Gallery Climate Coalition. So do you think, how, how seriously do you think the, the galleries are thinking about their fares and their fair footprint in terms of carbon footprint? I think a little bit at the moment. I, I mean, I always think, I'm afraid that economic is trumping people's um, people's decisions. I would love to say everyone was being more sustainable. I think, you know, the Paris Accord, the Parisians do take it very seriously. They have a mayor who takes it very seriously. And FIAC was in a temporary structure that actually is not going to be temporary. So they, they will eventually use it somewhere else in France. It will be, so they are quite conscious of it. I just think at the moment... It's a convenient thing to say. It backs the economic argument. It's important to artists and creatives. Let's see. I suspect in a few years' time, we're all going to really, really, really have to take it seriously for economic reasons. But at the moment, I think it's a lovely thing to say. I hope it's true, (laughs) is where I'm at. (laughs) That's excellent. I wanted to talk about this statement by David Zwerner, which was really notable, I thought, which he was he he expressed and he uses the term disappointed. He was disappointed with the sales at the Fiat Fair. He listed a whole load of artists whose work he'd sold for up to about (laughs) 400,000 euros. But before that, he did say actually the, the sales were disappointment after London had seemed so vibrant. I thought that was a notable comment. Yes, I thought that was interesting. I mean, I looked at it it looks to me like he's got a bit of an issue with FIAC, um, you know, generally rather than just this time. You know, it opened early yesterday. It opened at 10 o'clock, which for an art fair is early. And I think, and that was to accommodate you know, for COVID restrictions. It's in a new venue, which isn't as glorious as the Grand Palais because nothing is. And it started a little bit slowly, having had, as, as we were discussing, that kind of youthful buzz it in London. And I, you know, listen, there's only so many things that people can bring to fairs. And so when, you know, Oscar Murillo and Carol Beauvais, you could argue he threw his all in for freeze as well. You know, these things work both ways. I just think it's that trading mentality in London versus, you know, maybe that suited him better last week and this week less so. It's a different crowd. Everyone's best sales actually seem to have been in Basel. And that was the serious. People came there to to buy. It's the first fair for many people to visit. Um, And then Freeze had this kind of, oh, we're here for a bit of fun and we can buy artists a bit cheaper. FIAC is kind of in between the two. It's got some pretty serious, some pretty serious 20th century art. Um, And I do think people are taking their time and we're still only on day too so uh, and as you say Zwerner had some had some sales so I just think it's a different mentality it's more about making longer term relationships than quick sales absolutely but it is also interesting isn't it that you you know you're talking about the different character that all these fairs have and how much that is now going to be defined by the kind of uh, different collector bases that travel to the different uh, fairs so obviously there are fewer people traveling from america and that is a massive criterion in this but what do you think about this idea that there are basically there are just there are just sufficient enough collectors within the localities and i don't mean just in paris but mm. just within the certain localities of the fair that will that means that these fairs will continue to thrive but the audience will be much more local in a in a broad sense yeah i think that's the best outcome for fairs i think and and to make your ecological point you know for us all to be flying around the world to different fairs that all look the same, has for a while felt a bit daft. Um, I think the best outcome is, yes, the fairs are more local, they reflect the local market, but they have an international uh, outlook, which means everyone pulls their socks up and artists try and make their best works and galleries try and show their best works. Uh, I I think that's going to make every fair a better one. I guess one of the things I'm thinking is how is this possible? Because, of course, we've seen various sectors really struggling during the COVID crisis. But one of the sectors which really doesn't seem to be struggling is the market in the sense that, of course, the wealthy have got wealthier. And is is that what we're seeing play out in terms of, you know, that there is enough of a collector base to visit all the different fairs and to keep them thriving? Is Is that an effect of the wealthy staying wealthy or even getting richer? The wealthy staying wealthy and getting richer helps yes helps the market it helps and it's helping auction it's helping galleries whether or not that completely translates to art fairs um it remains to be seen i think that there will not be 365 art fairs um i, I don't think ever again i think the fairs that survive are going to be a little bit more reliant on things like sponsorship 
um, I think at the moment it's about you know you they make a third of their third of their money from galleries, a third from sponsorship, and a third from tickets. Um, broadly speaking, I think that sponsorship thing is going to have to get bigger because there's only so much they can charge the galleries and they may not have quite as many visitors. And to get sponsorship, you need to have a good brand. So it's I'm afraid it's going to be like a lot of things, which is we're going to see the, the, the bigger brands survive. Within that, hopefully there will be some local support and again, that would be that could be in the form of sponsorship for some of these smaller, more local, more niche fairs. But I, I, I think we're going to see the brands get bigger. So in summary, we're not looking at a binary of London's old school and Paris is this gleaming new light in the art market. Not quite, no, but it's really felt very beautiful and it did get some Americans because everyone loves Paris. Um, and I think that's going to stand in its favour. Melanie, thank you again for joining us. Thank you very much, Ben. The FIAC Art Fair continues until Sunday the 24th of October and you can read more reports on the fair on our website and apps. Melanie Gerlis's book, The Art Fair Story, A Roller Coaster Ride, is published by Lund Humphreys on the 1st of December and priced £19.99. Coming up, we talk about Marlene Dumas and Christian Boltanski. But first, here are a few of the top stories on our website this week. A dish until recently thought to be Korean at the British Museum has turned out to be an extremely rare Chinese glazed ceramic and nearly a thousand years old. Less than 100 stoneware pieces survive from the celebrated Ru kilns, which produced imperial ceramics for the Northern Song dynasty. As Martin Bailey writes, when Percival David, one of the greatest Western collectors of Chinese ceramics, bought the dish in New York in 1928, it was considered to be a Ru piece. But by the 1970s, it was downgraded and thought to have been a lesser piece made in Korea. But recent research, initiated by the German academic Regina Kral, has revealed that it was indeed made in a Ru kiln and can be dated from 1086 to 1125. Crimes involving cultural property flourished during 2020, despite restrictions on travel and access to public institutions during lockdowns, a new Interpol survey has found. As Catherine Hickley writes, police in 72 Interpol member countries seized more than 800,000 objects, more than half of them in Europe. The survey also reported marked increases in illicit excavations in Africa, the Americas and Asia and the South Pacific. Crimes in museums, however, declined in all regions except the Americas. The number of offences reported in the Americas in 2020 was almost double the 2019 figure. In Europe, the figure climbed to 6,251 from 5,088 offences. In Asia and Africa, meanwhile, the overall number of reported offences declined from 2019. And finally, the towering new museum dedicated to Edvard Munch in Oslo is now open, providing a colossal stage for Munch's extraordinary gift to the city on his death in 1944. Around 28,000 works, paintings, drawings, sculptures, prints and photographs, along with his papers and personal effects. Since 1963, the collection had been housed in a low-lying building in the residential district of Toyen. The decision to move was prompted by the 2004 theft of two paintings, The Scream and Madonna, as well as the conditions in which Munch's works were being presented. The new museum on Oslo's waterfront, rebranded simply as Munch, provides five times more visitor space and costs a reported 2.25 billion Norwegian kroner, or around $260 million. You can read about these stories and much more on the website or the apps. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Mark your calendar for the auction event of the season as Christie's New York hosts the 20th, 21st century art sale series beginning on the 9th of November. Engage in a nuanced narrative where Kaibot, Cezanne, Monet and Van Gogh meet iconic playmakers Warhol, Basquiat, Ruscha and Banksy and experience one of the greatest American collections ever to come to market with the Cox Collection. Where the physical widens to the digital in NFTs, explore the lasting impacts of the modern market on the art of today. Find out more at christies.com. 
Welcome back. Now, it's the bicentenary of the birth of the poet and critic Charles Baudelaire, and to mark the anniversary, the South African artist Marlene Dumas has created a series of paintings inspired by his book of prose poems, The Paris Spleen. It's one of two exhibitions at the museum featuring Dumas' work. For this episode's Work of the Week, Donation Grau, the curator of contemporary programmes at the Musée d'Orsay, has chosen to talk about one of the works in the Paris Spleen series, The Lady of Uruk, which is based on the Mask of Waka, a marble head made in 3100 BCE, which is now in the National Museum of Iraq. But he also tells us much more about Dumas' extraordinary new body of work. Donation, you've got two shows of Marlène Dumas at the museum. Can you tell me about those shows? Absolutely. Uh, first of all, we wanted to invite uh, Marlene Duma because she is one of the world's foremost painters. And of course, because her relation to her history and art history, and especially modern and early modern art history as the 19th century, which of course is the focus of the Musée d'Orsay, uh, is just really fascinated by that period. And so therefore, it was a, an ongoing conversation uh, with her for the last uh, four years. Uh, so basically, Sarah arrived at the museum. Um, and the first idea was for her to be uh, the first living artist ever to be invited to present a work in dialogue with the Impressionist Gallery, which of course is the beating heart of the Musée d'Orsay. So that was a starting point, and then it further uh, unraveled into what is now called Conversations, which is in the Impressionist Gallery, which features three of Marlene's major works in conversation with four of the collection's major works, including Starry Night, and uh, in which the lighting, the display, everything was conceived uh, in dialogue with Marlene. But then as our conversation further developed, we decided to do something that probably I think has not been done much, to say the least, in major museums and especially heritage museum, which is to do not one exhibition, but actually two. And the second was that she was working on a series of works based on Baudelaire's uh, The Paris Spleen. And we were in the process of designing a war program uh, rooted in the celebration of the 200th anniversary uh, of Baudelaire's birth. And therefore, it felt like a compelling case to show both projects, what is really uh, in a very porous space and the other that is in a very sort of closed in space and to feature them at the same time. That's fascinating. And tell me about the Paris Spleen, because obviously this is a posthumous series of poems by Baudelaire. And what was it that particularly drew Marlene to that text? Well, uh, it was a conversation initially with her friend, the translator who sadly passed away uh, a couple of months ago because of COVID, uh, Hafid Boisa, with whom she had already worked on a translation and edition of and illustrations of your own Shakespeare's Venus and Adonis. So she's moving from the British to the French. <laughs> um, and so she had already worked on that with him. And he saw a painting of hers that she was working on. And he saw, but for me, that's the double room, one of Baudelaire's poems in the Paris theme. And so the conversation further developed between the two. And that conversation led to an unfinished series of translations by Hafid and this series of works by Marlene which are really a multiplicity of takes on Baudelaire, a multiplicity of takes on painting, which of course was a very important subject for Baudelaire himself, but a multiplicity of takes on both Baudelaire and painting. And to an extent, I could even argue that painting and Baudelaire become one thing for Marlene. Is it too much of a stretch to say she was responding to that dictum, you know, to, to paint modern life, to respond to the, to the world around her? I mean, it's a strange and a contradiction because, you know, it, when, when Baudelaire uses that phrase, the painter of modern life, currently at the museum, we have an extraordinary display of Constantin Guise, you know, the artist who was the painter of modern life. And in a way, Constantin Guise was the Andy Warhol of his time. He was an illustrator. He wasn't a, a real artist. And that's why actually uh, Baudelaire chose him, didn't choose Manet, didn't choose Courbet, were his friends. He chose actually somebody who was an illustrator and made fashion illustrations and also made war illustrations actually, for uh, an English journal. And so, in a way, it is the relation to modern life, to the city. There are a number of themes, but it's not in the literal way of, uh, it's not in the literal way of Constantin Guise's approach to that, which is very an art. And Marlene is very much uh, a history painter. She deals with history, she deals with bread, she deals with love, she deals with emotions. And in a way, she is the painter of the modern life Baudelaire was talking about, but she isn't the painter of modern life that Baudelaire was talking about. Okay, that's great. Um, I'm interested in the fact that, as you say, she, in, in some ways it's a very direct engagement with the Paris Spleen. There is literally a portrait of Baudelaire in, in among the works. Two. Oh, two portraits of Baudelaire. But also, as you say, there are some more which are more esoteric in terms of their engagement with, with the text. Tell, tell us about some of those. 
Well, I mean, that's one of the things that I think is extraordinary with Marlene is that she is an incredible painter, of course, and she's also incredibly intelligent. You know, in her own, she's an extraordinary thinker, writer on art. And what I really uh, was, as a literary scholar myself, what I was really struck by, uh, you know, in the way she approached the Paris Spleen, is that she has approached it in many ways. There are some works that are direct illustrations, and she doesn't shy away from the word. There are illustrations of poem, like The Poor Boy's Toy or uh, The Old Woman's Despair, for example. There are portraits, Baudelaire, Jeanne Duval herself, um, they are works that are more allegorical in a way, the seascape and the landscape, which for her uh, relate to uh, The Foreigner, that extraordinary poem of Baudelaire, we talked about loving the clouds. Uh, and then there are poems that are much more uh, sort of symbolic in a way, and very like a candle or, or a bottle. And, and then there are these very monumental uh, paintings uh, that are sort of bursts of energy. And I think what's extraordinary with Marlene is that she, in the same way as in a painting, she doesn't have one set formula. In the way she looks at the art, she doesn't have one set formula, the way she looks at poetry. And so this you know, sort of connection and uh, between painting and poetry is, I think, at the very center. And the way she finds many ways to engage with Baudelaire's uh, poetry is the way she finds many ways to engage with painting. Tell us about the painting that you've chosen to really focus on then. It's called The Lady of Uruk and it engages very directly with a masterpiece from the ancient world. I mean, for me, it's a work that, re first of all, it's an extraordinary work. Uh, it is a complete masterpiece. When you are in front of it, uh, you really are in front of something that is just out of this world. And, and I think that's something that's quite specific to Marlene, is that she makes work that are such extraordinary charisma. Uh, to them, and that is absolutely spectacular. But and what's even more spectacular is if you start looking at the painting, it belongs to the series of paintings she made that are these square, large portraits, like Beshekva, we're displaying in the Impressionist Gallery, Dialogue with Starry Night. So it's part of that series. And as part of that series, if you look at the painting very closely, it's an extraordinary mess of paint. There are so many stratas. She actually painted it over another painting that she destroyed, basically, by painting over it. And then you can see things unraveling. And you can see it being sort of a map of, of the world. You know, you, some people have seen uh, fishes and clouds in it. They've seen many things. But it, so you have this capacity that Marlene has, this ability to do something that is incredibly messy and then end up being a complete masterpiece. And then, of course, there are uh, the layers of meaning to it. And for me, that's, they really say something about the way Marlene's mind works. And it's an extraordinary way because she, it starts with this um, sculpture from 3100 BC, uh, which was uh, this, which is a portrait of a Sumerian goddess, which was found uh, in Iraq, and then which is a true masterpiece, and is today at the National Museum uh, of Iraq. And the thing is that it was stolen during the the war in Iraq, and retrieved. And so it comes with all these loaded, uh, you know, stories and identities that have consistently changed. It comes with very ancient history, which is also something Marlene is very sensitive to. But at the same time, for Marlene, it is also a way to address a, a, a one of the poems en prose, you know, one of the poems in the Paris spleen, that is Venus and the Fool. And so it's what's extraordinary, and that's really how Marlene's mind works. She takes something that is uh, an image that has a very strong political meaning, but is also extraordinarily ancient. And she identifies it as a, the image of Baudelarian beauty, which is what Venus is all about. And then she makes it into an extraordinary mess of painting by painting over something else and managing to create this image of perfect harmony through, to an extent, chaos. And the other thing that fascinates me with it is how she thought of it as a as an image of perfect beauty in a way. And that's fascinating because when we did the layout of the show and we installed it together, uh, she decided that there would be on one side of the painting, if you come to the Musée d'Orsay, you'll see it. On one side is a candle, the passing of time, and on the right, and that's on the left side, on the right side is a rat. And of course, rats are a very important uh, aspect of uh, this work, but they're also, you know, the ignominy, the ugliness. So you have ugliness, beauty, the passing of time. And really all those layers in making a work that is so extraordinarily charismatic really say so much about Marlene, her work, and her way of seeing the world. 
One of the things I was first struck by when I saw an image of this painting was about the fact that through translating a sculptural form into painting, it somehow imbues it with, with the warmth of a body. And it seemed to me that that might be something that Marlene was trying to do with this, in a, in a way conjuring the human behind the ancient world and the modern world at the same time. So in other words, the human story of Iraq. I think, you know, Marlene's work, I mean, it's always difficult to say that an artist's work is about something. But what it does is that it also deals with coexistence. You know, how things can be together, how we can exist together. Peaceful and not so peaceful coexistence. And I think, you know, what's extraordinary about this painting and its motif is the ability to consistently shift, to lead from one thing to another and still be in the same space. So you're right, it is a, a sculpture that becomes a painting. It is an image of perfection that becomes imperfect, but then becomes a form of perfection again as a painting. It is also the color changes. You know, she changed. The color of the painting is not the color of the sculpture. And then eventually, you know, from something that is a goddess, it is a depiction of a goddess, it becomes something that is extraordinarily human. And eventually what it also does, and that's how it also ties to Baudelaire, is that Baudelaire is all about the fascination for a past that he knew was gone and the knowledge of the present that was coming. And that image, you know, something that is so part of the present and its traumas, and then comes from, you know, some very distant place in history and culture and aesthetics, and that is still with us today, having gone through all those histories. I think that's the multiplicity and the polyphony uh, of Marlene's work and Marlene's reading of Baudelaire. That's wonderful. And, and, and obviously, when one thinks about Baudelaire, one thinks about Manet. And I wonder if there was also something that, that Marlene, as well as sort of grappling with Baudelaire, was also wanting to grapple with Manet to a certain degree. Yeah, it, it's, it's Manet and it's Courbet. You, for example, I mean, as you know, in the studio of the painter, the famous uh, erased portrait is the one of Jeanne Duval. And, um, and, and, and Marlene did make a portrait of Jeanne Duval as part of the series, uh, which is one of the most startling paintings of the whole series. I think, you know, Marlene, what's really extraordinary with her, one of many things that are extraordinary with her, is her ability to bring everything together, as they said. So when you look at her paintings, you will see the seascapes, the immediate uh, connection in the 19th century art historian will make is, is Courbet. Um, but then, of course, it's also Manet. You know, I was just thinking, as you mentioned, that the famous escape of Rochefort, you know, in a way which connects in the way the blue is painted. But Marlene has this ability that really great masters have to take everything and make it their own without necessarily um, uh, losing her angle to a style. You know, there are, you, rec you, you probably would recognize a Marlene Duma painting, but she's always trying something new. And uh, and this tension between recognizability, which is the truth of masters, but also pushing that, pushing the recognizability of the work, pushing the recognizability of style, pushing the recognizability of the motif often as well. You know, that is something that is very uh, specific to our art. That's great. And tell us about the works that are in amongst the collection. You say about, in a way, you sort of rehung the collection to incorporate Marlene's work. One room. Yes, exactly. One room of the collection. But it, but it's interesting to me that, um, because one of the things about um putting contemporary works among works from the past is that you're constantly aware of the shifts in language between the present language of painting and 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 even 150 to 200 years ago um do you feel look like that the that there's a sort of consistency of language or do you feel there's a there's a very deliberate jarring quality also in amongst it and is that essential First of all, we chose the works very carefully with Marlene in three of her most important works. Waiting for Meaning, which is a painting from 1988, The Death of the Author from 2003, and uh, and Moshekva from 2006. And the four works of my collection are two, are two reclining news, one by Bernard and one by Lautrec, the famous Alone painting. Uh, and then the uh, Camille on her deathbed, the extraordinary painting by Monet of his uh, wife, which just passed away and of course uh, Starry Night um, but I think there are several layers to this as always with Marlene the one layer is a conversation specific conversation between works these two dead figures you know Monet's wife Camille 
in Spain, and then of course uh, the the writer we said in Celine. It's not about Celine himself. It really is about a dead figure in the death of the author. Then there are the three reclining nudes, um, and then there are um, there's the fact that when she painted Mashekva, she made his uh, who actually is an extraordinary artist, Mashekva Langa. She made his forehead into a sky, a landscape in the sky, and which is inspired by Starry Night. And so you know, and then there is this overall theme, which is how figure becomes landscape, which you can see in, you know, all the works we, we chose together. But one of the things that I think is really important is that we, when we think about, uh, you know, contemporary presences uh, amongst historical connections, you know, often we think of it in terms of, let's place this next to that. And, and I think that that isn't really true because what is really important isn't necessarily the juxtaposition. Sure, it is important, but not just the juxtaposition. For example, normally, if you go through the Impressionist Gallery, and Malin is indeed the first living artist whose work is presented in the Impressionist Gallery, um, you know, you will see that we hang works very closely one to the other. Uh, it's it's the way we do it. We have many master's pieces. We want our audience to see as many as possible. Um, we will also see that we use spotlights on specific uh, paintings to emphasize the dramatic effect, uh, which of course is a way to treat them as a masterpiece if they are. But Marlene completely turned this upside down. First of all, more diffuse lighting, no spotlight on a specific painting, completely changes the experience. Then much of space. So if you come to the Musée d'Orsay, you will see Starry Night with more space than you will ever have to see it normally when it's in the Françoise Cachan Gallery, the Post Impressionist Gallery. So. What is interesting that it's not just about let's place this together, even though it is also about that. It's about how do we create a context for visibility. And the other thing that's interesting, and that's also the relation between the two shows, is that one show is very much about, um, you know, the, the sort of self-contained space. And that's what, uh, you know, the Paris Spin is about. But then the other is very much about porosity. So I was just with visitors today, and it's really interesting because when you come in, you see something, when you come from the other way, you see something else, and it is really about the porosity between the works. I think the truth is that when you do that, if the work is strong enough, it holds. And Marlene is a painter in the tradition of great painters. She's also very much a contemporary figure dealing with the present, but she's also a great master in the lineages of great masters. So it was very important for us, for the first time we would do this, you know, placing a work of a living artist in front of Starry Night may be a little bit of a challenge. But that's the proof of Marlene's genius that it holds. And so that's why it works, because there is relevance, because there is a thought of the artist on how to present things, and because the work holds. Donessia, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Thank you so much, Ben, for your invitation. Marlene Dumas' exhibitions, The Paris Spleen and Conversations, are at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris until the 30th of January. Now, Christian Boltanski, the great French artist, died in July, aged 76. Last week, three venues in Paris and Versailles launched a joint tribute to him. His work, The Speaking Clock, is in the Chateau de Versailles, the Christian Boltanski archives in the Grand Gallery in the Louvre, and a group of works, including Heart, which is a recording of Boltanski's own heartbeat, are in the Centre Pompidou. I spoke to Annalisa Rimaldo, a curator at the Pompidou, about this extraordinary tribute in some of France's greatest cultural venues. Annalisa, I can't remember an occasion when so many leading French organisations work together to pay tribute to a single artist. It's really quite an extraordinary moment, this, isn't it? Yeah, it is a very special occasion. And I think that um, it's because Christian Boltanski was a, a, a very huge artist. I mean, not only in our times, but uh, for art history in general. And that's the reason why uh, some institution as uh, Chateau de Versailles or Louvre that are not really linked, uh, uh, I mean, every time with contemporary art. Can you tell me about the way that you've gone about choosing which works to show? Because, of course, Boltanski's work is so obsessed with memory and with death and, and life, of course. So tell me about the works that you've chosen to show in the different places. Yeah, so we choose all together. The Chateau de Versailles decided to uh, install um, the piece uh, named L'Horloge Parlante, uh, Speaking Clock. 
Voltanski made this uh, work in 2003, and uh, it took part of the show Trace du Sacré that same year. And after that, um, he decided to install uh, the work in a crypt, uh, the crypt of the Salzburg Cathedral in Austria. And um, it was the first time that I uh, listened to that sound piece, um, uh, because I'd never been in Salzburg. It was really uh, special uh, to have this uh, other location, because Chateau de Versailles decided to install this piece in uh, Chapelle Royale is the royal chapel, uh, I mean the location where the king assists to the mass every day at 10 o'clock, <laughs> very richly decorated and um, with a lot of uh, uh, light. So strange location, but interesting because I mean it's a very, the summary of the terrestrial power and uh, power of time take another dimension there, so stronger than, than ever. I mean, one of the things about Boltanski, of course, is that he's famous for, as well as having a sort of dark quality to his work, his his sense of humour. Yeah. And it occurs to me, for that piece being installed in the Chateau de Versailles, and especially in the Royal Chapel, he would have seen, if not the funny side, but he would have been amused that it was there, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is a gap also between the, the content of the sound pieces and the, and the voices that is a very cold one. You know, there is a a lot of voices, among them also Boltanski, but, um, you know, voices say it very, yeah, in a cold way, robotic way, each five seconds, the time, exactly the time, is violent, at the same time, with this cold expression, is really violent, and humoristic too. Yeah, and of course, that the Louvre, there's a vast installation there, isn't there? Yeah, sure. There too, I think that uh, Boltanski, yeah, funny, funny situation, because it is in front of Leonardo da Vinci in the Grand Gallery <laughs> among the Italian paintings is a strange situation too um, because the pieces we install uh, there is uh, Les Archives de Christian Boltanski 1965-1988 the archives of Christian Boltanski 1965 until 1988 is um, a piece composed by 646 rusted boxes, iron boxes, and uh, 32 uh, office lamps. In the box, uh, uh, um, we are supposed to find uh, archives by the artist, but nobody <laughs> opened the boxes, <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> yeah, uh, normally we install these pieces in a very dark room, silent space, very intimate uh, situations. And uh, but it's not the case uh, uh, in this installation. We are in, in a very big uh, flux of people that are there to see the Gioconda. Yeah, the Gioconda is, is the Mona Lisa, of course, yeah, as we know. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah, sure. <laughs> so it's a strange object in that space. But uh, finally, he creates a kind of dialogue, very, very poetic dialogue with other pieces around because there is a kind of silent mind space yeah, in this work, because it's a special work, it's a very special work. Mm. And um, there is a dialogue with Leonardo, who also works with light, or with this fumato. It's a kind of uh, yeah, vocabulary that is not uh, precise, as uh, Boltanski. Boltanski superposed all the time presence and absence, offered and stolen, and singular and universal personal, anonymous. So it's a, a quite interesting dialogue there. And uh, also um, an ex extraordinary different point of view uh, faced to the one who was uh, uh, the humanistic one, I mean, with the power of the man, with the uh, religious point of view, and um, yeah, a new point of view with this kind of space and no space in a human credo, but another one. Boltanski said that uh, he always think that uh, everyone life is uh, an holy life. So I think it's an interest dialogue between pieces there. 
That's right. It's that every life a holy life. Every life is worth something. Yeah. It's intriguing because, of course, there's that self-mythology that goes on in his work. His work refers to himself a hell of a lot. And that continues at the Pompidou, doesn't it? Because at the Pompidou, there's the impossible life of CB, as, as it's called. Yeah, well, we ask uh, around pieces around uh, this work that um, uh, Boltanski made uh, in 2001, and the title of that piece is the same of the first film uh, he made in 1968, film that doesn't exist anymore, and uh, um, also the title of the first uh, uh, solo show he made uh, at the same time. Till two years after, he decided to make this piece with the same title and is more more violent than before i mean uh, there is a really an impossibility of life and um, the pieces is composed by 10 gridded um, between uh, shelters multiple testimonies of um, his life as personal as they are insignificant but there is a you know metro tickets here or pressing invoices but also curators letters director letters love letters um, photos but you cannot uh, read everything uh, because uh, sometimes they are superposed there is a grid on the surface and also a light neon light that can allow you to to really read everything. The idea is that um, even if scrupulously assembled or collected, uh, this trace cannot give you an exemplary image of the life, cannot satisfy the memory of uh, the being. So Boltanski at that time changed a little his point of view and um, devoted 20 years um, of his career to a mythical aspect of the work, ephemeral also. There is a lot of um, uh, pieces that are produced, but uh, yeah, he decided to not conserve objects. So we decided to put together in the same room with um, uh, uh, La Vie Impossible de Christian Boltanski, piece called Art, which is um, you know the trace of the art beat of um, Christian Boltanski. In 2005, he created a device that could link uh, his um, heartbeat recorded to uh, light bulbs that uh, goes on and off um, uh, depending of frequencies. And after, uh, he decided to collect the trace uh, heartbeat of uh, everyone. People go in uh, to his uh, shows, but after that also he decided to have a a station kind of database, he construct um, a building in, um, in Tashima, so far island in Japan. And uh, now I think the, uh, the database have more than uh, 70,000 heartbeats of people in the world. And he said he was really struck by the fact that people's response to the work has changed because some people were treating it almost as a memorial of their loved ones. And so people would go to Teshima to listen yeah. to the heartbeat of somebody who was no longer alive. Yes, right? it's a very poignant trace uh, of someone. I mean, it's a symbol of life and also emotional proof for people. I mean, uh, yeah, for Boltanski, I think that uh, he imagined that... Um, Family members uh, uh, could, um, you know, see uh, in this trace uh, a strong link of memory. Absolutely. And of course, having that work heart in, in the Centre Pompidou, you've got the trace of his own life there in the space, his heart that is no longer pumping, pumping away in the gallery and the light flashing with it. That must be terrifically poignant. I can't imagine what it must be like to be there now knowing that he has passed away. Yeah, but uh, it's not, uh, as every time, it's not only his heartbeat. I mean, uh, um, as always, there's a um, kind of uh, that of the others. I mean, it could be the art of every everyone. So it's the same thing. And uh, we prepare the visit because uh, before to go in that room with um, La Vie Impossible and Cœur, um, uh, art, you have a lot of book uh, made uh, um, between 1969 and uh, uh, 90s, uh, also because we, we show also Menschlich. 
So you can see the progression in the superposition of the is life and life of everybody. The first book we show is, uh, uh, sure, the manifest uh, research, uh, research and presentation uh, of uh, all that remains of my childhood, 1944-1955. And also, uh, we show the masterpiece, the vitrine de référence. Um, that means the vitrine uh, with um, showcase with uh, all the uh, relics of the artistic gesture in uh, in that time. It's very um, hard to show Boltanski after his past because um, the content of his work could be so simple and so huge so it's difficult to conserve the same um, dimension of the work that he gave to the work um, he was always quite frank about his own mortality wasn't he even in the in the works that you just described but also the fact that the show at the Pompidou was called Faire Son Temps but it was a pun in a sense because it's sort of making his times, but it also means he's done. Yeah. You know, a kind of joke about the retrospective. I remember that um, he began the interview that is published in the in the book, in the catalogue, and said, um, I'm in additional time. I could have been there uh, 15 years ago. That is the beginning of our interview. <laughs> <laughs> But um, I wanted to, to dwell on that, on that, you know, his, if not obsession with death, his preoccupation with death and, you know, how it did have a very serious intent in lots of ways in the, in the sense that, for instance, there are works where he does directly engage with, for instance, the Holocaust. So, so he talks about death in all sorts of ways as a sort of essential fact of life, but also he marks death in quite profound ways as well, doesn't he? Yeah, I think that he was mocked about that uh, when he was a child. And finally, I think that uh, is a mark for uh, every time. But um, at the moment of his life, when the father died, probably it took in, um, a very huge important things in Jewish past. And, and probably this kind of trauma would be more important. But after that... The memory was, uh, and the problem of death and life was a very general one. I mean, Christian said that um, Shoah was important, but um, there are all other situations, you know, that are being also proof of human beings and human conditions. So that was the problem. And finally, even if it was obsessed by death, I think that the real content was life finally he always said that the life is um, a dash between two dates born date and death date and um, finally if you think about that he consecrated all his huge work to this very imperceptible sign as a very humble point of view uh, on his work and I really think that the, uh, the question uh, since the beginning was, uh, what is life? Why, why stay there? He said also that um, memory could, could resist just for two generations. You can remember about your father, mother, grandmother, grandfather, but not more than that. So why? You know, a lot of efforts and the memory of you stayed just, uh, you know, eight years, 10 years, 100 years. I think that the question um, since the beginning was life and not death, but confronting himself with life uh, is normal in human condition to talk about finitude, fate and destiny, a very uh, a subject that, uh, ontological subject that uh, finally are uh, superposed with the uh, same subject of a philosopher, anthropologist, um, a very large field. I wanted to talk about his visual language because one of the things, you, as you say, he used to often use very simple means, but he was capable of using those simple means to the most dramatic kind of effects, wasn't he? Because when, when one thinks about Persson in the Grand Palais, the, these piles of clothes, as you say, the most simple kinds of everyday materials, and yet somehow the gesture was vast and it filled that enormous space. You're right, and... Um... 
I was uh, surprised when he, he told me a day that um, he liked very much the rhetoric uh, point of view of Bossuet, you know, the French preacher of the 17th century. And um, yeah, he was also attracted by this kind of dramatic and very gestures kind of uh, uh, media. But he was also attracted by another kind of drama. For example, he always said that Jesus Christ um, is only in a Catholic religion. You have a, a, a God that is a, a really a poor man, probably the less poor of uh, all. So um, the drama was in both, I mean, in the excess uh, as uh, in the absence, I mean, in the in the minimal situation. And finally, I wanted to ask about, about his reputation among the French people, because I think he was quite surprised by how popular his show at the Centre Pompidou was, his recent retrospective, wasn't he? In a way, it seemed he was nervous about the reaction of the French people to his work. Yes, because I think uh, French people know very well the work of Boltanski, so I was stressed about that. But um, I think that it was also very happy to make um, a retrospective in Saint Pompidou, where he did the first one, because the first retrospective um, was in '84, and curated also by uh, Bernard Blistain, both. So I think that he, he was very happy to do that in Paris and in Saint Pompidou. And um, we don't talk about force because uh, the tribute we made uh, recently also this uh, opera that was remade in the parking of Saint Pompidou. And um, the first time he made uh, in Saint Pompidou, it was um, January. He liked very much that people um, are, you know, in cold. Cold was a, a, an effect very important of the, the situation because it's a kind of uh, Dante or Faust trip, you know, in below the, the scene, below the stage, below everything, in a very no way space. It was very poignant at that time because uh, the opera is a kind of. Uh, uh, you know, there is a lot of musician that uh, not at the same time uh, play something. And there is also a singer, that um, opera singer, that make event uh, um, uh, around. And people don't have uh, a purpose, really. You know, you have just to walk around, to listen to things that happened around you. And you can leave, you can stay. But people wait for something that doesn't come. And I think that he liked very much this kind of situation, really. <laughs> Annalisa, thank you so much for talking to us about Christian Boltanski. Oh my, it was a pleasure. Thank you to you. Speaking Clock is in the Royal Chapel at the Chateau de Versailles until the 6th of November. The work, the Christian Boltanski Archives, 1965 to 1988, is at the Musée du Louvre until the 10th of January next year, and the three works at the Centre Pompidou are there until the 13th of April 2022. And that's all for this episode. Do subscribe to this podcast and a brush with our sister podcast, and please give us a rating or review if you've enjoyed it. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Julia Mahalska, Amy Dawson and David Clack, and David also does the editing and sound design. Thanks also to Henrietta Bentel and Daniela Hathaway, and to this week's guests, Melanie, Donasia and Annalisa, and thank you for listening. See you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.